you all for coming. And I want to definitely thank the center for giving me the opportunity uh, to reflect on what's been going on um, in Nicaragua since April last. You know, half of the crowd I know here has been, lived in Nicaragua, uh, has been following very closely what the events that are going on. So um, what I want to talk to you about today is some reflections uh, looking at Nicaragua from a historical perspective because that's what I'm trained to do. And then leave hopefully plenty of time for us to have a conversation because none of this is, is, is over by any means. But I want to start by showing you these slides which I did not make and I couldn't really give any credit because I got these from France in Nicaragua um, in April. And for those of you who have been there, what strikes me at these are, of course, that they are references to the Sandinista Revolution in 1979. This one specifically is Monimbo, one of the places where most of the insurrections took place, where an insurrection just took place in 2018. Here is another one, part of that same whoever it was that was making these slides. Right, comparing the Somoza's National Guard to the Policia Nacional today. And then the last one, which was uh, the insurrection in 1979 and Monimbo in 2018. So what struck me about these particular um, pictures was the reference point that they were working from, right? Because there's been a great deal of debate about to, about whether what's been going on in Nicaragua since April is a coup attempt on the part of right-wing forces that include the U.S. government or that have been put up to the coup by the U.S. government or if this is a uh, popular movement that is um, has a different origins and grassroots, et cetera, et cetera. So that's um, what I want to talk a little bit about today. And I am of the second opinion, although I will talk about sort of what's going on from what we know about U.S. involvement. Um, I, again, here's another one of those uh, posters that is making the rounds and is the comparison between Ortega and Somoza, right? The saying Ortega and Somoza son la misma cosa. Um, so I want to talk about how the discourse that is being used in Nicaragua today uh, harkens very much to Nicaraguan history and it represents a, uh, in many ways Different groups of people are reliving part of the Sandinista revolution in particular, and other groups of people are trying to um, sort of live their own revolution because they were too young to uh, when, when the 1979-1990 revolution was going on, uh, which is not to say that there are not also very conservative forces involved here, and I will try to talk about all of them. But I want to start with... Uh, I won't talk about the revolution because I assume that people know something about that. Because I want to start by talking about the, oops, you know, the world. Yeah, okay, that's the, uh, the period between 1980 and 2006, which was in 1980, the Frente loses elections, the revolution uh, leaves power, <coughs> and then for the next 16 years, you have this period of intense neoliberalism and a whole series of things that happen that I believe is really what sets the stage or that is the, the background that we need to understand in order to take a look at and understand what's going on today since Daniel has went back to power, which was in 2006. And the first thing, um, of course, was the, these, these years sunk Nicaragua to a level of poverty that was below Honduras, and that's pretty low. Okay. Nobody will ever be as low as Haiti, but being as low as Honduras is pretty bad. Nicaragua sunk into the depth of poverty over the 16 years of neoliberalism with unparalleled, unparalleled level of corruption under all the different governments that are involved in, Doña Violeta Chamorro, um, Arnoldo Alemán, uh, Bolaños, right? All, the, all that stuff was going on. So Nicaragua hit some statistics of... 44% of the population living on less than a dollar by 1998. I mean, we are really um, hit that level of poverty. Uh, and Nicaragua is going to be very important later for the resurgence of the Frente. At the same time, there are internal party dynamics going on within the FSLN 
uh, that were quite public at the time that um, some people see as either a, a, a continuation of the party itself, seeing itself as a vanguard revolutionary party with all the baggage that that means, um, and other people seeing it as the decomposition of the um, of the FSLN, right? The rotting of the party from within. The organization was torn apart right off the bat by the infamous Piñata. Um, those, those of you that are that are my age will remember that, um, which whereby the party, uh, the, pro the property that had been part of the state, became the private property of many in the Sandinista leadership, including the Ortega family. Um, and there was never any accounting for it, as, as was demanded by people from within the party itself. There were a variety of different attempts to democratize the party in these years um, that were not allowed by Daniel Ortega. Uh, a chunk of people in 1994 of the layer that Nicaraguans themselves call the historic leadership of the FSLN, el liderazgo histórico, um, left the party in 94, defeated in its attempts to democratize the internal workings of the party from within. That first group of people who leave the party formed a movement that was called, that is called the Movimiento de Renovación Sandinista, the MRS. Uh, the people that are now accused by Ortega and his wife Rosario Murillo of being the right-wing faction behind the coup attempt. Um, the discontent from within the party continued in 1996 with the uh, revelations by Soy la America Narvaez Murillo that Daniel, her stepfather, had sexually assaulted her since she was 11 years old and for the rest, for the next 20 years. Um, Daniel never um, denied the accusations. It was Rosario Murillo as the mother who came to her husband's defense, um, calling uh, Soil America all kinds of nasty names uh, before a national audience. A very, very, very ugly period. And Nicaraguan feminine, feminists who were in, in the period of neoliberalism finally um, freed from party structures that had really kept the lid on them throughout the period of the revolution did their best and were the only ones that really tried to hold Ortega accountable, but they too failed. Their defiance would not be forgotten and I'll come back to that. Other groups of Sandinistas continued to try to reform the party from within and try to lead it towards some kind of internal democracy without any success. The MRS is the best known uh, Sandinista or party, but, there were, but it was not the only one. There's at least mm, one, two, three, four other different kinds of groups from within the party that were trying to do something about it. At the end of the day, however, um, the Ortega position always won. As FSLN members were reminded that you had to maintain party discipline, right? Um, so this, this, this idea of the vanguard revolutionary party with all of its members can debate things, but at the end, the, you have to maintain the line of the, what, the part, what the internal party leaders decide, and you have to be disciplined. And the FSLN members that continued in the party did maintain that discipline. The cumulative effects of these um, kinds of, of internal um, politics going on within the party meant that, at least in the point of view of Nicaraguans who still consider themselves Sandinistas, who are Sandinistas, is that the, the, the FSLN became a uh, shell of its former self. A shell that Daniel Ortega grew into as personal armor. So the party became the dominion of one man and the vehicle of one man um, in his continued search for power. Ortega ran for elections twice. Uh, both times he lost them. He won 38 to 40 percent of the vote, a respectable percentage, right? Which tell us, tells us that Nicaraguans continue to see um, him as the standard bearer of the memory, at least in the hope of the Sandinista revolution, 
um, and especially among the poor, who grew exponentially as a result of neoliberalism. Okay. Other rank and file Sandinistas who were very unhappy with the direction of the party nevertheless continued voting for Daniel. Because what they told me is that they just held their noses and voted for Ortega because they would never vote for any other candidate who was not Sandinista. Certainly that notion is something that we're familiar with um, in this country. And then in August 1999, oh no, I still, let me go back to here, this one, uh, El Pacto, right? The other, the other third sort of leg of this dynamic that, that I think was going on. President Arnoldo Aleman, right here, and Daniel signed a thing that was called Acuerdo de Gobernabilidad, an agreement of bipartisanship the Nicaraguans immediately, immediately compared to previous infamous pacts within Nicaraguan history. The first one of them being the Pact del Espino Negro, which was the pact that Sandino rebelled against in 1927. Other sectors of Nicaraguan society also repudiated this very openly, and they continued to remind the population that what was going on between the, the talks between Daniel Ortega and Arnoldo Aleman were very similar to the talks that Somoza used to do with the old parties to keep themselves uh, in power. Aleman and Ortega agreed to a series of constitutional amendments and changes to the electoral laws. Uh, it's a long thing, but for our purposes, there are two uh, important parts of that pact. One of them was that the agreement granted each other, meaning Aleman and Ortega, uh, seats in the National Assembly, and with that, parliamentary immunity that both of them sought. Um, Aleman, because he didn't want to be brought up on charges on incredible corruption, and Daniel, because he didn't want to be brought up on charges of sexual assault. The other important uh, thing that, come out, that came out of the, of the, uh, of the pact was the lowering of the percentage needed to win the presidency. And it is kind of complicated, but what's important for us to know is that thereafter, uh, this is August 1999, whichever candidate won 35% of the popular vote in the first round became president without having to go to a second round. And 35% if we think about how Daniel had been winning, had been getting 38 to 40 percent of the elections, that number was chosen very thoughtfully, right? Um, FSLN members criticized the pact mercilessly as taking people back to Somosismo. So again, you know, this memory of we're going backwards in history. Uh, they accused the ones that were more out there accused Ortega of quote unquote kidnapping the party to satisfy his own political ambitions. Uh, okay, so let's move on to, so let's look at Daniel Ortega in power from 2006 to the present. So he's been in there a little over 10 years. In the political side, one of the things I think that Daniel learned a, a number of lessons from the experience of being in power during the years of the Sandinista Revolution between 79 and 90. One of them, mm, well, the first lesson, I think, is uh, you got to place nice with the church. The church in Nicaragua has been right-wing, continues to be right-wing, will probably always be right-wing. And as you will recall, Cardenal Obando y Bravo, who is the person that we see in the picture, was one of the main foes of the Sandinista Revolution for the entire period from 79 to 90, um, and an absolutely key person in the destruction of the Sandinista Revolution. So one of the things that Daniel announces in 2008, two years after he has been, elect he has been elected, uh, and I have the percentage somewhere, he was elected with 38.7% of the vote, right? So which had been the traditional number right about the 35 percent. One of the, for the, he announces that he's a changed man. One, he says, con un corazón de izquierda justiciero y una cabeza de derecha responsable, which I think is an absolutely fabulous quote, right? The heart of a social justice, of a leftist social justice warrior 
at the head of a responsible right winger. Uh, what that has meant in practice is, you know, uh, it's a couple of things. On the political side, was um, absolutely making nice with the church. So, one of the things that became that has been the hallmark of of Daniel and then Rosario Murillo, his um, his wife, from the moment that they were in uh, that came back to power was this is the, the slogan of, of, of what they were calling the second phase of the Sanista Revolution, Cristiana Socialista Solidaria, right? Nicaragua being Cristiana Socialista in Nicaragua, and of course notice that Cristiana goes first, right? So again, it's trying to appropriate or steal the thunder from, uh, from the church, from the right-wing church. Daniel and Rosario um, publicly present themselves as Christians, as Catholics, they get married in the church, and the, car the cardinal marries them, and it, this is a public event, everybody gets to see it. Um, and, um, and what the cardinal gets in return is the total, total ban on abortion uh, in Nicaragua, right? one of the most draconian abortion laws now in Latin America, uh, for sure. So payback for the feminists in some ways, it can be seen as that, certainly in Nicaragua that is how it's seen, for the feminists and then for Soil America, you throw them um, under the bus uh, for sure, and, uh, and you neutralize the church. Hmm, I might have done the same thing, I mean, this is a pretty good move on his part, considering again that he's going back to the history that the Sandinista party had with a very conservative um, church. The other second part of sort of um, his, the, the, what we see happening in Nicaragua between 2006 and to now in the political sphere, it's really the closing of the space. If Daniel was, was willing to negotiate with the cardinal, he was not willing to negotiate with anybody to his left. So the space for leftist criticism from within and without was very quickly uh, closed. Uh, NGOs with any kind of social justice then came under scrutiny immediately as soon as Daniel was elected to power in 2006, losing access to funding if they criticized the government um, openly. Individuals who did not demonstrate loyalty to Ortega lost access to whatever you need to have access in society and lost jobs including men who had been in very high levels and in the positions, like um, ex-comandante Luis Carrion, who very quietly lost his job because he did, not, um, he did not show the line that Ortega wanted him to follow. Um, on the, let me see if I wanna show you, yes. Um, one of the things that the, that the, the Ortega family did, and again this is definitely a debate that goes back to the Sandinista revolution, but actually a, a, an aspect of political culture in Nicaragua that goes back to Somoza, is the question of the control over the media, right? Because uh, whoever controls the media controls the message. So the, 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 if you just take a look at any of the materials that were produced by the Sandinista party from 2006 until now, they all echo uh, the Sandinista revolution. So for example, I think, I'm not so sure, but I, but I think this is the picture that, that Lou de Mateus took. One of the pictures that Lou de Mateus took, I know some of you know him, uh, from the triumph in 1979. It has just been updated, right, to give it to, or, or appropriated, depends on how you want to see it, to associate what's going on in Nicaragua in the crowds with Daniel in the second phase of the Sandinista revolution. Um, so this, this control of the media as much as possible is said to be happening in part because the Ortega family, if not Daniel himself, but the Ortega family uh, controls eight radio stations uh, and three TV stations. Again, how much um, the Ortega family and the clan 
owns and how much it's, it, it, it actually controls is very hard to say because none of that information is very public. It's the kind of thing that, that everybody knows, but you're not going to find you know, a place to put a footnote on it. Um, all the other parties, the traditional parties, have largely become anachronistic, non-functional, really obsolete um, in this case. And as this, has be as this becomes sort of the reality of Nicaraguan, uh, of Nicaraguan uh, political culture, Daniel has, in fact, accumulated really as much power as the last of the Samosas, you know, in terms of the weight that they have politically. This is what some political scientists are calling caudillismo patrimonialista, right? Going back to Nicaraguan history, Somoza in the 19th century and other uh, uh, Latin American uh, unfortunate historical traditions. And the economic side, okay, so on the political side, right? You play nice with the right, particularly the church. Uh, you pretty much dismantle the opposition parties that were very weak to begin with. You curtail the space for a left, particularly a Sandinista left that may try to uh, have claims to the revolution that Daniel wants to claim for himself. And then we move on to the economic sector. The economic sector, um, again, one of, the, one of the lessons that I believe that Daniel learned from the Sandinista revolution is that you can antagonize, antagonize a private sector that in Nicaragua continue to be very strong, that sabotage the revolution, and you gotta play nice with them um, as well. In, uh, in the case of, from 2006 until very recently, uh, Nicaragua benefits from the pink tide, right? From the pink tide in Latin America, from the, from, from the, the, the swing to the left that is represented by this picture, where all those guys that you know who they are. Um, I think this is what Daniel meant by having the heart of a social justice uh, warrior and the head of a responsible right. Because as he attached himself to the pink tide, um, Ortega did two things. One, he maintained an anti-imperialist discourse that kept his personality linked to the memory of Sandinista revolution, yet did not have to, and he did not have to touch the neoliberal economic model that was followed for 16 years, you know, until he came to power. Two, Nicaragua, by, become a, by becoming a member of the ALBA, the Alternativa Bolivariana, provided a market for Nicaragua's private sector. You know, historically suspicious of him, they weren't so sure that he had the head of a rightist, they, they still, they believe that he was very much the revolutionary on the, of the 80s. Um, and three, he personally gained access as the president, right, to a slush fund provided by the Venezuelan government. According to the U.S. Embassy, Nicaragua has received a total of $4 billion uh, from Venezuela since 2007. How much of that is the slush fund? How much of that is in other kinds of aid? Again, it's hard to say, but it's a chunk of money for a country that is that poor. That are, those arrangements made the Nicaraguan private sector very happy. They exported meat, sugar, other agricultural products to Venezuela to the tune of $438 million worth by 2012. This is how the Nicaraguan economy grew under Daniel Ortega. Employment went up, though that's not necessarily wages. Um, and not one member of the Nicaraguan private sector complained to the U.S. Embassy about Ortega, despite being reelected twice, uh, or despite allowing him to be reelected um, elected three times, re-elected twice, elected three times. Okay. As long as the economy was humming for the Nicaraguan private sector, they were happy to leave the politics to uh, Daniel. The Venezuela funding was absolutely key for this success, let's put it that way, of the Nicaraguan economy during these years. The funding that Daniel got for this slush fund that went directly to the president, he used that for social programs, again, that allowed him not to challenge structural inequalities, much less property relations. 
So Nicaragua, very much uh, uh, copying, taking a page out of Lula in Brazil, right, by, by the, the architect of this was Orlando Nunez, a name that some of you will be very familiar with, um, established its own version of Brazil's set of home program, right, Hambre Cero in Nicaragua. And that was followed by Usura Cero, Plan Techo, Merienda Escolar, Bono Productivo, Casas para el Pueblo, a whole series of programs um, that fit very nicely with that whole slogan of forging a Nicaragua that is Cristiana, Socialista, uh, Solidaria. This made Daniel a very popular figure among the poor, those who had been hardest hit by neoliberalism and that helped them to maintain that revolutionary persona and continuity with the Sandinista revolution, again, without touching you know, the structural inequalities that were so deeply rooted in the country. Uh, the control of media, uh, particularly television, some of, some of, some of the, the channels, some of the only channels that get seen in the Nicaraguan countryside are the ones that are controlled by the Ortega family, ensure that all images of Ortega would evoke memories of revolutionary um, times um, as well. And then you'll never stop you know, touring the country. Never, never stopped going out when they were giving the chickens or the pigs or whatever was part of these farms, all the same for the techos, etc., etc. So his, his kind of um, high touch with, uh, with the people in Nicaragua continued, particularly with the poor. Critics, as you sure you can guess, um, argue that this was no face of the Sandinista revolution. Rather, what Ortega was creating was a system of clientelism reminiscent of Latin American geopolitics that's been going around since the 19th century. Only people who belong to organizations controlled by the FSLN, including uh, the new Consejos de Poder Ciudadano, the CPDs, that were supposed to be like the new and improved versions of the Comités de Defensa Sandinistas, um, that, in, that, that, that are now run directly from Rosario Murillo's office uh, were eligible for benefits, right? So if you were not part of these structures that were directly controlled from the top, you were not eligible uh, for benefits. At the same time, a new generation of young people who knew the history of the Sandinista revolution and, and, and grew up under neoliberalism and the, disas the disastrous effects that it had on the Nicaraguan uh, uh, on the Nicaraguan uh, people populated a new Juventud Sandinista, right? Another structure that was uh, picked up from the Sandinista revolution and who were eager to play their role in this new, new phase of the Sandinista revolution. Uh, Sandinistas of the original Juventud Sandinista, however, at least have argued to me that this generation knows nothing of the mística, right? The characterized Los Muchachos of the late 70s and 80s, when self-sacrifice and service to the Nicaraguan people was a 24-7 occupation. According to them, the way they see it, the Juventud Sandinista of today is a cheerleading squad for Ortega, a cheerleading squad that became Fuerzas de Choque um, since April. But overall, the pink tide served Nicaragua's economy really well. The economy achieved growth rates of 4 to 5% uh, per year, cut poverty <coughs> rates by half. Uh, and again, how those things are measured, we will have to do a little bit more investigating than I was able to do. Uh, but Daniel knew, of course, as former high-level Sandinistas told me, uh, that you couldn't count on Venezuela forever. I mean, you know, uh, the Sandinista government who, or the Sandinistas, or Ortega, who really believe that they will stay in power forever because this will be the revolution uh, in a second or third phase, forever needed to find its own sources of income. And this is where the Canal Project came in. That was the point of Law 840, right? Uh, passed in June 2013 that allowed foreign investment, in this particular case, the Chinese, to carve out a canal through Nicaragua. I mean, that idea is as old as the country itself, almost, right? It goes back to the dawn of the 20th century when the U.S. Corps of Engineers mapped out the whole canal, the whole project, never built it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The protests that follow the law and the government response 
in many ways prefigure what we're seeing since the crisis of 2018. The law allowed not only for the digging of a canal, but for a whole series of development projects that were going to uh, bring in money into the government through um, tariffs and through permits, um, et cetera, et cetera. The plans were going to affect somewhere between 60 to 120,000 people, uh, none of whom were consulted, of course. This is one of the marches that, um, that happened as a result of that. Um, and a whole series, a whole series of marches followed. 48 different local marches, five national protests, mostly composed of campesinos, indigenous, indigenous folks, environmentalists, um, and the government responded with, uh, with massive repression, tear gas, detentions, violence, including the use of paramilitary forces, right? Left nobody dead, thank God, but a series of wounded. Uh, the promises of land and relocation for the people who are going to be affected were not enough, right? The project by all, by, by all accounts, is pretty much defunct since 2016 as the Chinese uh, economy took a downturn. Nobody is talking about it. But it also means that the, that the government was now left without what it was hoping would be its long-term source of, an independent, of independent income. And what I want to point out about this one is, okay, so th this is one of the marches against the canal. In Ortega Vende Patria, the Vende Patria slogan comes straight back out of Sandino. This was Sandino's slogan back to the 1920s when he was opposing the occupation of the Marines when the canal was um, yet another specter of, of U.S. domination over um, Nicaragua. Okay. So the collapse of the Venezuelan economy after the death of Chavez, the drop in oil pr uh, prices, the coming of Maduro into uh, power of Venezuela has affected Nicaragua in very profound ways. Right? This always happens when you're a tiny country and you're attached to countries that are bigger than you. Um, and, and this is evidenced by the immediate cause of the April protests, the cuts to social security. But I think the fact of the matter is, and I think pretty much everybody agrees, of this is that the protests that we're seeing since 20, since April are really not economic, they are really uh, political. So who are the protesters and why are they protesting? Events have unfolded very quickly. If you were keeping track of this, it was like your head was spinning because you couldn't tell who was who and who was what. Uh, because the, the, the guerra mediática, as the Nicaraguans are calling it, it's really hard to figure out, not only for those of us who are looking at it from the outside, but for Nicaraguans themselves within Nicaragua. Um, let's see. Ortega announced reforms to Social Security. You get a small protest by elderly people, or people who are at least are of that age. Uh, the government uses repressive force against it. And that leads to massive protests uh, pretty much the next day with young men taking the lead. Right? There's massive protests uh, that are overwhelmingly peaceful. But there are people at the end of all these demonstrations, at the margins of every second, second of every kind of, uh, of protest, where you have all these young Nicaraguan men, whether they're going to school or not, we don't know whether they're involved in some kind of, of gang activity, as Daniel has accused them of being, we don't know. But to me and to other people who are involved with this, these young men are reliving their own version of being opposed to oppression, being opposed to an authoritarian regime. They're living their own revolution, if you will. Right? It is not unusual for very young men to test out you know, their own masculinity in the political sphere through some level of very aggressive um, activity. And in the case of Nicaragua, this becomes the excuse that the government uses to come down in massive repression. Massive repression, right? In many ways, it was the, 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 the massive repression that the government used that then led 
to uh, shock the nation, again, because this was supposed to be a revolutionary government, right? You are not supposed to just open fire on protesters when you're a revolutionary government. So you get massive, massive demonstrations, right? Uh, hundreds of thousands all over the country calling straight out for the resignation of now the dictator, right? So Daniel is now has that over his head. Straight back to Somoza. Very blunt reference to pre-1979 history. The, demonstra the demonstrations are from all walks of life, right? All walks of life, from the right to the left. But clearly, they are overwhelmingly poor people, because that's who Nicaragua saw, right? An overwhelming amount of poor people whose faith in this, in, in this argument or in this self-representation of Daniel as a revolutionary is beginning to uh, be shaken up. It does include quite a bit of representation from the historical leadership of the FSLN, you know, the most famous people that you might recognize is, of course, Dora Maria Telles, Julio Lopez Campos, Joaquin Cuadra, Ana Margarita Vigil, and, uh, and my former boss, Vilma Núñez de Escorcia. Next thing you know, right, the students took over the universities, and then other sectors set up the barricades all over Managua, all the way to the Costa Rican border. Everything stops, right? At first, Daniel and Rosario derided the protest. Then they shifted gears and called for a dialogue. The church was going to be the mediator. Everybody knows the church was not a mediator. The church has been, always will be, um, against the Nien. The dialogue went nowhere, um, and that was taken as a signal within Nicaraguan circles that the private sector had abandoned Ortega, that they were not willing to go the distance with him. Right. Uh, the protests multiplied all over the country. A national strike paralyzed the country's economy. Uh, in an unmistakable sign now that the private sector would not defend Ortega. For them, that agreement was no longer holding up, particularly in light of what was going on in, in, in Venezuela and the drop in Nicaraguan exports to them. So the violence has escalated. Um, and what's interesting to see, again, is the, you know, the references, Que se rinda tu madre, is a reference to Leonel Rugama, one of the heroes of the pre-1979 uh, movements against Somoza, uh, who was gunned down by the National Guard and who is alleged to have said, you know, as he was uh, massacred, que se rinda tu madre, he was not going to come out, right? Rather die on your feet, kind of thing. Um, Sandino los llamaba vendepatrias, get another reference. And all you got to do is do a very simple search, and if you know what the references are, you will see how much at this level, on the, on the popular level, all these references are to Nicaraguan history, and specifically to a left and critical uh, Nicaraguan history. You will see... The, the pictures of Susan Maicelas, particularly the guy that became called Molotov Man, being reproduced. Uh, and in Masaya and Monimbo, uh, let me see, that's not the one that I want, um, where you actually, I think, reach the level of insurrection of violence, like you did in 79. Uh, the, 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 there were <coughs> clashes between the police and um, in, uh, um, in the population, the iconic figure, and if I have it, well, I'll have it somewhere, but I'll show it to you in a minute. For this insurrection is going to be the, uh, the firecracker mortar that I'm sure you have all seen. Nicaraguans use that to shoot firecrackers, right? Um, so they, they've now become the, uh, the, the uh, sort of favorite weapon among all these young men. Uh, clashing with the paramilitaries that have been brought onto the street um, while the army uh, stays back. I wanted to show you this picture because it was a great deal of uh, this, 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 this part of the group of paramilitaries that came in to, uh, take, over, to take over or to liberate, as they were saying, uh, Monimbo and Masaya, all dressed in blue 
and this guy is over here then with Daniel and then with some of the para, uh, with one of the paramilitaries was the subdirector of the police right this was the group that carried out what 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 the, Nicar what the Nicaraguan government was the uh, operación limpieza right to to uh, dismantle all the barricades in Monimbo and, and to take it back after a battle that lasted uh, nearly half a day. I also want to show you this picture because this are one of the one, like one of the people fighting on the on the government side as part of the militaries. Retired guy from the from the Ejército Popular Sandinista, right? Uh, supporting of Daniel, using again all the the Sandino. Uh, the FSLN and uh, claiming uh, the legacy of Sandino and using the image of Che also claiming um, a revolutionary uh, sort of heritage. Okay. Um, the presidential uh, couple went on the offensive, denying any responsibility for bloodshed for a while, uh, blaming the violence on the protesters who Daniel Ortega said were being manipulated by the CIA without even realizing, right? That was a very insulting thing for him to say. That's been the official discourse ever since, right? There is no opposition. There was a coup attempt carried out by the right wing orchestrated from Washington. That position, as you know, has been defended also by some groups and individuals in the U.S who were sympathetic to the Sanista revolution and who believe that Ortega still represents the revolutionary uh, flame within Nicaragua in a genuine anti-imperialist position. Uh, it, in, in the fate of our history and, and how ironic these things are, the U.S. government also believes that in that sense. Uh, they agree with that, with that interpretation that the presidential couple is a representative of a revolution but they see them as communist puppets of Maduro uh, in, of Cuba, and they ruin the country. Uh, the Cold War rhetoric going on in social media is remarkable. The, 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 it, everybody's reliving the Cold War, and everybody's reliving uh, the Contra War. Nicaraguans in the US, Nicaraguans um, inside Nicaragua, and everybody else. To what degree those really those genuine right wing right wing groups of Nicaraguans are operating on the ground among the protesters it's hard to say but their presence on social media is extremely prominent you can just go and look it up and it's it's very disjointed but it is okay um, my argument is that those who defend Ortega from an anti-imperialist perspective, reliving Cold War, the Contra War, uh, share something else with Cold War warriors. They both demonstrate a remarkable ignorance of Nicaraguan history. Okay. Let us remember that there was a reason why Gabriela Mistral called Sandino's army El Pequeño Ejército Loco. Right? Because Sandino and a handful of men did expect to defeat the U.S. Marines, and they did, you know? Let us remember that a long, young, long poet named Rigoberto Lopez Perez was the one who assassinated Anastasio, Anastasio Somoza in September in 1956 on his own, inspired by the ideas that were um, circulating. Let us also remember that a young group of wealthy conservatives led by Pedro Joaquin Chamorro invaded Nicaragua from Costa Rica three years later, in 1959, attempting to overthrow Luis Somoza. He failed. He ended up in jail for it. Uh, and became, through La Prensa, one of the strongest anti-Somoza uh, uh, figures in the country. The FSLN itself was down to a handful, a handful of guerrillas when the National Guard killed Carlos Fonseca Amador in 1976. And yet, Three years later, the Frente was in power, okay? All that is to say is that Nicaraguans do not need the CIA to identify authoritarians, to organize against them, and to get rid of them. This is well within precedence, okay? What does the opposition want? Now, given this, the, the diversity within the opposition and their lived historical experience, 
it should be no surprise that it has taken quite a while for protesters to come up with a plan, a program, or even a set of demands. Students, in a very similar fashion uh, to sectors of the Arab Spring or to Occupy in the U.S., were adamant about not wanting a party or any other traditional form of political organization. It was not until October 4th and you, and you, that, that a formal Manifiesto de Unidad Nacional Azul y Blanco came out. You can go online and you can look it up. It is an official statement by 43 different civil society organizations. Uh, it has a list of 10 principles and values, 10 urgent demands, 13 commitments. The immediate demand, of course, is the removal of the presidential couple through what they're calling a democratic transition through early elections at the national, regional, and municipal levels. And their ultimate goal is, they say, the establishment of democracy, which really is an accomplishment of the 1990 uh, revolution, the, 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 the election that unseated the FSLN. They have a whole set of other demands that would not be surprising, immediate entry repression, freedom of, uh, for political prisoners, freedom of association, freedom of expression, the end of reprisal against state workers who support the opposition, respect for human rights, the whole ball of wax that's been around since the Enlightenment. Okay. What is Ortega doing now? And, and I'm about to wrap up. Uh, the mass protests have continued, uh, have given way to like small protests almost every day. There's almost some kind of protest almost every day. But the space for critique has been constrained significantly. Uh, Daniel Ortega and Rosario Menyu are coming down very hard, but legally, um, on the population. Right? They just passed a new anti-terrorism law that, um, that rebounds a specific agency that can now ask to see your books uh, to sanction you if they find that you have given any kind of support for uh, for oppositions, and that's got the private sector very jittery, as you can imagine. They are also passing new laws to regulate, contain, and make illegal anti-government demonstrations, uh, policies that are all inevitably reminiscent of Somoza's approach to oppositions. Foreigners have been advised to avoid criticism of state, uh, the state under penalty of deportation, including those who became naturalized and Nicaraguan citizens during the Sandinista revolution. So some of my friends are falling into that category. Um, opposition figures, primarily those who lay claim to Sandinismo, nevertheless arguing that Ortega has lost his legitimacy, that he has lost the streets, quote unquote, that he has been strategically defeated. Uh, 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 a term that should be very familiar to those of you who lived in Nicaragua in, 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 through the latter part of the Contra War, because that's the exact same phrase, phrase that Humberto Ortega used to use to refer to the Contra, and that that's the reason why the Contra came to negotiations in 1989. So these people say it's a matter of time before, uh, it's only a matter of time before Daniel is out of power. And they are definitely looking in all of their analysis, if you read them, and they're, again, they're all available on Facebook, um, they're looking to patterns in Nicaraguan history. So Mosa didn't go into exile at the first attack carried out by the FSLN, or the first, or the second, or the third insurrection. It took time, but in 1979, he finally left. Okay. So the role of the US. There's a saying in Spanish, that has been in my mind a lot as I keep thinking about what's going on in Nicaragua, and that's a Rio Revuelto Ganancia de Pescadores. I think there is no question, there's no question, that there's a lot of shadowy forces involved in the opposition against Daniel Ortega and Rosario Amarillo, and the U.S. government is one of them. Between 1990 and 2006, again, the, the, the neoliberal years, the usual U.S. agencies were very active in Nicaragua. USAID, NED, CIA, the whole alphabet soup, all of them claiming to be supporting building democracy. However, since Daniel was elected president in 2006, there has been surprisingly little activity against them in US government circles, okay? The Nicaragua Investment Conditionality Act, that is called the NICA Act, is a piece of legislation 
that is going to constrain aids foreign aid to Nicaragua based on all these conditions that the U.S. government wants to put out, which is straight out of a Cold War document. That was not approved by the House of Representatives until 2016, okay? A full 10 years after the Nietzsche election. The, to me, this is testament to how pleased the private sector was with Ortega for a whole decade. And as long as they don't complain, the American embassy doesn't complain, and Washington doesn't do anything. Further proof of that is that the bill died in the U.S. Senate altogether. No sponsors, nobody cared. It has been revived now in September in light of the current crisis. Um, I think the current crisis caught the U.S. government by surprise. That hasn't stopped, for example, specifically Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, and Ileana Ross Lettinen from trying to make hay of the situation very quickly. They met with three Nicaraguan University students who traveled to the U.S. in June uh, seeking aid. Um, at that trip was criticized by other students who felt that this was ill-advised, naive perhaps, and one of the results or pitfalls of a leaderless movement. I think it's going to be a while before we actually get very specific information about how and evidence about how the U.S. is involved. But there is no quiz. There is no question that they are. But what is clear to me is that this opposition to Nicaragua is homegrown, massive, and fully precedented in Nicaraguan history. Uh, where it'll go, it's hard to tell at the moment. Oh, and this one I just want to show you. That this is the the slogan of. Um, the, the, the people who support Nicaragua, in particular the paramilitaries, mi comandante se queda. Yet another reference to Daniel, not as president, but as comandante, right? Um, this is one of the latest marches, and I think, um, check out the symbols, right? The, uh, uh, not, clearly not a message to Nicaragua, but a message that places this group of people in the uh, same uh, category as other youth movements that have been happening uh, in the U.S. Um, and in other places in the world. Uh, this is Vilma Nunez who has been amazing into, into her 80s in defense of human rights in Nicaragua. Um, and there's a whole series of posters that the Sandinistas currently in power uh, has, have made about prominent um, historical leadership of Sandinismo, there's one of Carlos Chamorro, and there's a bunch of other people um, to um, accuse him of being coup plotters. Okay. So it's hard to know where we're going, um, much less who will end up uh, winning in this wrestling over the history and meaning of Sandinismo, uh, but nobody's about to surrender. That I can tell you for a fact. Daniel and Rosario are not going to give up at all. They really do see themselves as we got back in power. We are never leaving power again. Right? There were so many rumors already even uh, four or five years ago that Rosario would be running for president after Daniel, even though she really is not popular. Uh, so that is the thinking, right? In light of the reality, I think what we have to do as Americans in this country is again to follow the example of the Nicaraguan people and what they're setting, the, the, the example that they're setting for us and then recover another piece of this history between the U.S. and um, Latin America and Nicaragua specifically. My favorite, the Anti-Imperialist League, which encompassed opposition to U.S. intervention in Nicaragua and one of whose proud members was none other than Mark Twain. Right? So we've been at this for a while. Or if you like, we can go back and recreate those networks of solidarity with the people of Nicaragua right? um, as a movement. Because as it should be, and as it will be, um, it's going to be Nicaraguans who will decide what they're going to do about their government, uh, no matter what people are thinking in Washington. Okay, so thank you very much.